Welcome to my talk, Servlet and Reactive Stacks. Uh, you have choices, <clears throat> choices to make and also choices to uh, learn and understand. Um, so as you probably know by now from the keynote and from a lot of the messages that we've had uh, around Spring Framework 5 is that we actually have two uh, different, a choice of two different stacks. One is the Servlet and the other one is the Reactive Stack. And this represents a big shift, uh, generally speaking, uh, towards asynchronous and non-blocking uh, as a concurrency model. Um, and this is a big trend that um, we're gonna talk about. And it's important to understand what the choices are that we provide and also to understand the differences uh, because from there, uh, I believe that's a big part of making a choice. And um, I also believe quite strongly that uh, generally, when we embrace or start doing something new, the best way to, uh, to get there is to first to understand how it connects to what you already have or to what you already know. Uh, so in this talk, instead of just talking about WebFlux and focusing on the reactive stack, we're actually going to talk about Spring MVC and also about the reactive features and see how uh, they combine and compare together so we can really understand uh, what each one provides and uh, what you can use in your projects. A couple of words about me, uh, Spring Firmware Committer. I've been involved with Spring MVC for three generations now, so I've been through the evolution of the servlet stack for quite a few years. And I was also involved in uh, the um, creation of Spring WebFlux, so I've seen that from the beginning. So I have a good perspective on both um, in terms of uh, you know, where they come from, what their strengths are, um, and what are the limitations. So let's start by talking about uh, change. What, what is the reason why we have all of these new features and why uh, are we doing all of this? So um, of course you've heard about reactive from many different angles by now and uh, uh, this is me on the right, right hand side, <laughs> um, kind of promising that everything is going to be great. Um, and um, turns out that actually behind all this talk about reactive, and of course reactive is quite a buzzword by now, and uh, everybody uh, is mentioning it in all sorts of contexts. Um, and it's natural to wonder, is this thing for real? Is this just another hype? Um, well, it turns out that there is in fact a, a real trend. There's a real underlying uh, thing going on underneath, and that has to do with um, asynchronicity. So in many respects, uh, this is a story of growing asynchronicity. This isn't necessarily, um, you know, kind of a, a heart-stopping moment uh, where, you know, we can't continue to do things the way we are uh, doing them. We've obviously been doing things for a long time, uh, but uh, we also have uh, quite a, a bit of change happening that has to do with asynchronicity. And concurrency is a problem which is hard in a couple of ways. I mean, obviously in Java we have thread pools and that allows us to quite easily make things concurrent um, around an imperative programming model. But um, this is in some respects misleading because when you start going down that path, the more uh, you deal with asynchronicity and being non-blocking, uh, the more challenging it becomes. And in the servlet API world, uh, this is you know, something that we haven't really experienced as a pain for a long time uh, because the servlet container provides us with a, a thread pool model and all we had to do uh, was to develop you know, our request processing logic um, and go from there. But over time, you know, in modern day applications, uh, almost anything you do, asynchronicity is hiding in the corner. Uh, if we talk about uh, microservices uh, style architecture, um, being distributed and making remote calls is almost a starting point uh, for what you have to do. Um, <clears throat> so the more you're exposed to dealing with this kind of asynchronicity, uh, the more uh, it becomes a challenge. And it's a challenge in a couple of different ways. The first one is the programming model. Um, when you are dealing with concurrency, you have to um, have shared data, you have to have synchronization around that, and this is um, a hard problem. This is hard to uh, work with and it's hard to get it right, <clears throat> and you can have many issues over time. The second one is actually the footprint of the application. When you're using an imperative programming model and you, that involves blocking operations, um, it's actually difficult to scale in an efficient manner. Um, 
and not surprisingly, over time, uh, a lot of different solutions have appeared uh, in different languages and platforms um, and projects to deal with this, different ways to make concurrency a concern at a lower level, not something that the application has to code, because this is a hard problem that not everybody uh, should be solving. Um, so for example, um, how many of you um, have been exposed to uh, or using Kotlin? How many Kotlin users in the room? Okay, a few hands. Um, and in Kotlin, for example, we have a, a solution for this called coroutines. And um, that um, kind of provides a different way to consume or, or to create uh, applications in imperative style uh, where the blocking becomes cheaper. Uh, so it's not as expensive as uh, blocking threads. Um, we have a proposal now in Java for uh, Fibers, Project Loom. Of course, it's very early days for uh, most of this. Uh, we will see. Um, and there's actors and there are other approaches to this problem, messaging-based um, communication. Um, and uh, this is really what we're talking about. I mean, it's interesting to see you know, Kotlin or even Java now trying to address the problem of this growing asynchronicity. How do we make that simpler and actually cheaper uh, in terms of resource utilization um, coming from the language level. But here we're looking at it from, um, from what we can do today. Um, how do we solve this problem? Um, because this is a real problem for applications. Now, because we're used to imperative uh, model of programming, in Java we have a bit of a misconception. Uh, this is something I run into quite often uh, to think that uh, in order to scale, in order to be highly concurrent, you need a lot of threads. And this is valid point uh, if you think about uh, kind of imperative programming model, uh, because if you're blocking, the only way to become concurrent is to use a thread and to make sure that these things can run at the same time. But it's not the only way to achieve concurrency. So for example, uh, you can run with a very small number of threads um, and do things in a much more event-driven fashion where you only deal with a particular task when you can continue without blocking. So that involves a lot of callbacks and notifications. Um, and a good example of that is Node.js. Um, I mean, Node.js kind of popularized this um, model of concurrency uh, with only a single thread, right? That's, that's how uh, they can run a server application. And what that uh, proves is that you can be highly concurrent uh, with a very small footprint. Um, it becomes quite expensive um, if you want to scale. Uh, well, you can say threads are cheap, right? So, but you have 100, you have 1,000, you have 10,000, 100,000. At some point, you reach a limit. You can't really create 100,000 threads. Uh, but at the same time, you can imagine trying to scale to uh, tens of thousands of uh, connections um, on a given JVM. Uh, so the um, kind of the reactive model or the non-blocking asynchronous model, uh, especially uh, running on an event loop like Node.js, uh, gives the opportunity to actually scale in a very different way with a small fixed number of threads. So if you ever have any doubt about this, just think how, how is it possible that it can be done uh, in something like Node.js. So if we want to use this kind of non-blocking concurrency model, um, there's something called event loop, and if you want a good starting point for learning, then this is uh, something to Google uh, and to start to try and understand how, how that actually works. Uh, but essentially, uh, we want to be prepared to process, um, let's say in an HTTP server environment, we want to be able to process chunks of data at a time. Um, in order to be able to do that, we have to become a lot more event driven. A few, a little bit of data came in. What can we do? How much data do we have so far? Can we serialize that into a JSON object? Uh, deserialize it into a JSON object? Um, and in order to be able to process in this mode, uh, we have to become very much um, event driven. So that's the foundation. Um, how can we run on such a foundation on top? Certainly not with an imperative uh, model. <clears throat> um, so this is where. Um, reactive libraries come, um, and the notion of declarative composition of asynchronous logic. Uh, so you might be familiar with that from something like completable future in Java 8, uh, which gives you the ability to say what should happen when the value becomes available. Let's say something is an asynchronous operation, a result is going to come back at some point, either a result or an error. Uh, 
what do we do next? Um, so completable future gives these um, uh, methods that allow you to declare what should happen next. And um, that's a, um, a good programming model because it doesn't involve um, using a lot of callbacks, right? Because typically with callbacks, and this is a common problem in asynchronous programming, is that you're doing something asynchronously, then you're getting a result back, and that's a notification, that's one callback. Then within that, you may make another asynchronous operation that gives you another callback, and you can start nesting pretty quickly. Uh, but with declarative composition, kind of continuation style API, it lets you to declare uh, things in uh, terms of operators. So if you're familiar with the Java 8 stream API, for example, uh, it's very similar um, experience to using that. And uh, ReactiveX um, as a, um, a ReactiveX as a, as a technology came from Microsoft. It provides uh, various um, operators uh, that you can use um, as a vocabulary of operators. Uh, so we have the Java 8 stream API, but ReactiveX goes far beyond that, uh, especially for hot streams of da data um, uh, going much beyond the semantics of, of collections, basically. Now, Reactor is a project that um, is managed here um, at Pivotal. Uh, we have uh, people working on it, and uh, it was created with ReactiveX in mind, so it aligns generally with the vocabulary of ReactiveX. So if you're familiar with RxJS or RxJava, basically you will find that Reactor um, uh, is your friend, uh, in a sense, or that it's quite easy to get adjusted to using it. Uh, but Reactor at the same time is, is built for server-side Java applications. It's built um, side by side with uh, Webflux and other Spring projects. Uh, so it's actually very much um, tailored uh, to the needs and built around the use cases that we encountered as we create Webflux. Um, another side to this story, kind of why the change is Java 8. Uh, the Lambda syntax in Java 8 uh, provides new possibilities and new capabilities. Uh, just like Java 5 uh, with the introduction of annotations, uh, we could have the annotated controllers. In Java 8, we have uh, lambdas, and that creates the possibility to think, uh, what can we do now? Um, how can we imagine a different way of processing requests uh, now with this uh, lambda syntax? Um, and it's also enormously helpful for uh, the reactive libraries because they also, this continuation style APIs like the lambdas, uh, like the completable future or ReactiveX, uh, they become much easier to use when you have the lambda syntax, much nicer uh, to read. Okay, so let's talk about um, the two uh, stacks and the choices that they provide. Now, uh, the reason why uh, choice is actually very important in this space, uh, so in the async non-blocking space, right, we're not the first to create such a framework. You know, Webflux is not um, a pioneer, if you will, in this space. There are others out there. Um, I think what um, is unique about what we create is that we try to link it to where we come from, and we try to uh, create continuity uh, where that's possible. Uh, so when you start using a new stack, you're not necessarily uh, leaving all the concepts behind. And the reason why this choice matters is because uh, there are not many situations in the real world where you can just start creating new applications. You have a lot of existing applications and uh, they're already using you know, certain technologies. Um, and it's not often that you can sit and rewrite them. Even if you want to, you know, it's not really uh, something that you do every day. Uh, there are particular cycles uh, to applications when new functionality needs to be developed. But also, uh, this reactive paradigm is not necessarily necessary for every application. Um, and that's a big part of the story, and this is why choice is very important, uh, so you can make uh, the right choice for the problem at hand. Um, so I'm just going to take you through and show you uh, how we've created choice at every level. Uh, so we have, uh, first of all, one of the things that we realized immediately is that uh, with the annotated controllers, you have flexible method signatures. And that means that we can support the same annotations in a on a reactive foundation. So we um, 
support annotated controllers with WebFlux as well. And you saw in the keynote this morning, and we're gonna see some examples uh, shortly. Uh, we realize we don't, we don't have to leave that behind. We don't have to create something new. Um, also, um, this was a little bit later in the 5.0 cycle of development uh, that we realized that initially we thought, uh, well, we're gonna keep the reactive support on the reactive stack, and then you, know, you have a clear choice between Spring MVC and WebFlux. But then at some point, as we gained experience um, and we saw uh, quite a bit uh, from, learned from the development of the reactive stack, we understood very well, um, actually, by that point, that uh, reactive features can be useful on the servlet stack as well. Uh, so, for example, the ability to call reactive clients is something that we support as a first-class uh, possibility in Spring MVC as well. And, of course, there are some differences, but uh, we'll talk about those. Um, we have a functional uh, endpoint programming model, and that's supported only on the WebFlux side. We, uh, this is something else which is unique to our offering. Uh, so the ability to use servlet containers, um, in particular servlet 3.1, um, certainly Tomcat and Jetty, uh, is also possible on the reactive stack. Uh, so we, uh, a lot of uh, companies um, that are using asynchronous solutions, typically they're dealing with Netty. You know, that's a very common choice um, in this space. Um, and we do support Netty, uh, but Tomcat and Jetty are also supported. Um, and uh, there is uh, a bit of a question here that often comes up. How is it possible that Tomcat and JD can be on both sides, supported on both stacks, and isn't there some sort of a disadvantage? Isn't it a compromise that we use Tomcat on the reactive stack? Well, the way we use Tomcat and JD on both sides is very different. On the uh, servlet stack, we use the, non -blo the, the blocking APIs, um, which you know, we can't change easily. Whereas on the reactive stack, we're actually going through the non-blocking IO API, uh, and we'll talk about that shortly. So basically on the reactive stack, we support Tomkin and JD, and that's um, pretty comparable to what we support with Netty. In other words, it's not a, really a drawback or a compromise. Okay, so I have a, a demo application, and we're gonna take a look um, at it. It's actually um, several applications, a um, couple of services, and then a front-end application. Um, it's intended to model um, the process of reserving a car. Uh, so there are a couple of uh, back-end services. For example, there is a car location service. And you can see here, uh, this is a controller, and it's accessing, uh, it's calling a repository, and that repository uh, is a reactive repository for Mongo, MongoDB. And um, this generally looks like a regular Spring MVC controller. Um, it's returning a flux. Uh, we're getting that directly from uh, the repository. Uh, we have a backend application uh, which um, does the actual booking for a particular car. Um, and this is using the uh, functional endpoint programming model. And you can see here um, a method reference. This is the actual handler. Uh, so here we're using the reactor mono type uh, to simulate a delay in the response. So if we're booking a car, there's going to be some delay in the response. And we want to simulate that. We're going to use the mono delay operator. Now, delay doesn't actually block. It's not the same as uh, thread sleep. Uh, delay is a scheduled operation so that in the given amount of time, uh, it will kick back and then uh, continue from there. So what we're doing here is we're coming up with a random think time of between two and five seconds. And then after that, and this is an example of the uh, declarative API. Here I can say what should happen after that time has uh, passed. Uh, we're going to create a server response uh, for um, you know, uh, giving the booking URL. So in this case, we're actually uh, automatically replying yes to the booking every time. Obviously, it's a very uh, simplified version of a real world application. Uh, the front end application is uh, a controller which does the uh, 
end-to-end -end booking. Uh, and in order to do that, it will call the uh, car service, the car location service. And you can see here that it's using the web client, actually a couple of different instances. And it's going to uh, retrieve uh, the data for that URL. We're going to deserialize the data as it comes back from, uh, from JSON into car objects. And then we're going to take the first five, um, uh, call flat map, which is essentially where we make a nested asynchronous call. And you can see here, we're gonna use the second web client to make a post uh, request to the booking service, and that's going to take two to five seconds. And then whichever one comes back first, that's the next operator, uh, which basically means take the first one and then ignore all the other ones, cancel uh, the rest. So let's try and run this. Oh, one thing I want to show you, uh, for this front end app, we're using the regular uh, Spring Boot starter. So that's a Spring MVC app. The front end is just a Spring MVC app. Okay, so we're gonna run this one. Uh, one thing in the location service app uh, that I wanna show you as well. You can see here on startup, we're going to insert uh, some random uh, car locations uh, into Mongo and save. And this is using the flux um, operator range uh, so we're gonna take from one to 100, we're gonna generate 100 locations. And for each one, uh, this location generator just gives me a random uh, location. Then we map that into a car, and then we wait until all of that data is inserted. So again, once you uh, enter into sort of this asynchronous non-blocking uh, model, uh, the assumption, so we support annotated controllers on both sides, but with WebFlux, the assumption is that you will never block. Uh, so you're using these kinds of operators to declare the logic. Okay, so let's start this one as well. And then finally, so this one is uh, using Netty. You can see that here. Uh, but the front end app is uh, Spring MVC and Tomcat. You can see that here. And the reason I'm using Spring MVC here is because I want to uh, show you, you know, these capabilities um, and uh, make it obvious that this is possible in Spring MVC. And then we're gonna talk about uh, the differences as well. Okay, so let's, um, we're gonna do a post. and that's gonna take two to five seconds. And then we come back with uh, booking from car number three. So if we take a look at the output, you can see here. Okay. So you can see here what happened. Again, this is Spring MVC. We have the dispatcher servlet, you know, as usual, processing the request. Uh, and that's happening on the Tomcat thread. You can see that here. Uh, then we're getting off the Tomcat thread. We're using the web client to actually start retrieving cars. And then for each car, we make an extra post, HTTP post to try to make the booking. Um, and you can see here the reactor, Netty, these are the web client threads uh, making those calls. Uh, but you will also notice that, you know, in the code, we're not actually dealing with threads. We're simply declaring what should happen um, and is being taken care of underneath. And in order to make that point even um, better, so let's, let's say we're gonna change this uh, here to skip the first four. Um, and then we're gonna take the next. And now we can, um, take five, the bookings. Uh, so that allows us to uh, print Okay, so let's take a look at this. Okay, so this is back up and running. We're gonna run this again. Okay, comes back. 
so we can see a little bit more here. You can see that we're getting um, all five cars and we're trying to book each one. And this is happening in thread number four. Uh, then uh, we're getting all the, we're allowing, we skipped the first four bookings. So that means we're allowed all of them to come through so we can print them out. And then we finally took the last one. And you can see here, I mean, this is happening in uh, thread number four, number two, number three, number one. So let's take a look actually uh, with, uh, at the threads. This might be a little bit small to see in the back, so I'll just explain here. Um, over here, we see the uh, about uh, 10 different uh, threads from Tomcat. So that's the server processing incoming requests. And then down here at the bottom are the reactor Neti threads. There's four of them. And um, so basically, if, you, if we scale this up, if we you know, start uh, sending requests concurrently, um, in order to make those remote calls from the server, we only need four threads. So the, the thread pool for React and Netty, the web client, is fixed. It doesn't need more threads in order to make uh, more concurrent requests. And this is a big deal uh, because, uh, again, if you take a look at the actual code, we, we never dealt with threads. This is a hard problem to solve, which is being solved for us by React and Netty, the web client which is using React and Eddy underneath. Um, it's, we're, we're, again, declaring that we want a stream of cars, and then for each one, we're making additional posts. Um, and you can imagine uh, a lot of uh, server processing many requests and doing this for each one of those requests concurrently. So the problem multiplies when you're using a client on the server side. This is why the efficiency and the uh, minimal use of resources uh, becomes quite important. And this is possible to do from uh, Spring MVC. Okay, so let's just do a quick switch to uh, Webflux. Import the changes and then restart. Should have waited a little bit longer. Okay, let's try again. Okay, so this time we're running with Netty. And let's close this. Location, this is the car app. So I just wanna show you that this time, yeah, you can probably visually see in the back, it's not as many threads. Uh, we have only four reactor Netty threads. Um, and what's interesting is that because out of the box we're running with Netty, uh, these four threads are the entire set of threads for the server and for the web client. So no matter what degree of concurrency you seek, the number of threads is not going to change. So this is a completely different uh, concurrency model that we're running on. Um, and again, as much as possible, as you can see, uh, I didn't change the source code. So we support this on Webflux and we support it on Spring MVC. You can get a lot of benefit on Spring MVC, but you get even more benefit in terms of the uh, resource footprint when you go to Webflux. Okay, so let's talk about what's in each one of these stacks. What's the architecture behind? Well, uh, for Spring MVC, we have classic servlet application. I mean, this is what we've been doing for a very long time. You have a servlet container, uh, you have the servlet API, and then uh, the framework uh, sitting on top. And uh, we're using blocking IO in order to uh, read and write. And then over time, the servlet API has also changed. Uh, so we have the async uh, support, uh, which came in version three of the servlet API. And that made it possible to uh, break the thread per request processing model, where for each um, incoming request, you have to have a dedicated thread. Um, so these are kind of like the lanes that uh, Phil talked about with the ducks swimming. <laughs> and if you have a cat that's really slow, 
Um, so basically what happens in this case is that um, if we decide that we want to do some processing asynchronously, we can exit the servlet container thread. We literally get all the way out and then uh, we finish later. And that's a capability that came in version three of the servlet API. So that essentially is what enables uh, us to support using reactive clients because we can create an async boundary between the Spring MVC controller and the, uh, the, the framework and the server the API underneath. And then in version 3.1, we also have the non-blocking I.O. And um, unfortunately, we weren't able to take advantage of that in Spring MVC because that's a very deep change. Uh, if you think about what it means to support non-blocking I.O., uh, if I'm reading the request body or writing the request body, the response body, any time that the connection slows down, I have to be able to say, okay, I'm going to stop and do something else and then come back to this when I can continue. That's very deep change and that's very difficult to support without rewriting a lot of things. Um, also, even the non-blocking IO API is kind of a different corner of the server the API. It's not the same, um, it's not the same uh, things that you're using. Um, and uh, Spring MVC has already been using the server API for a long time. And I think we're not the only ones in this space. I mean, obviously everybody else has the same problem. I'm not aware of any frameworks that are using the non-blocking IO um, other than in some very isolated fashion. So uh, when it comes to that, we couldn't really integrate it very deeply. Um, the only way to do it is to actually build a new stack, which is completely non-blocking from the ground up. And this is what we've done with uh, Webflux. So now um, the advantage here, um, and you can see that uh, the servlet API is at a much lower level now. It's not at the same level as it were, where it was before. It's merely an adapter layer. It allows us to uh, build uh, more on top. And it also allows us to support other servers. So now we can reach beyond servlet containers. Um, again, Netty, very, very widely used in a lot of places that are doing uh, high scale um, asynchronous um, applications. So we can support Netty and we're doing that through the React and Netty project. Um, and then on top of that, we have a web API, which is uh, sort of the same role and purpose as the servlet API, but it's completely non-blocking, um, unlike the synchronous versions of the servlet and filter contracts. And then of course, at the top of all that, we have uh, web frameworks, uh, Spring MVC on top of a servlet API foundation. We have Spring Webflux, but notice that Webflux does not build on the servlet API. It does not depend and does not expose the servlet API. Servlet API is still down there in the adapter layers, uh, but um, Webflux is actually built on a completely non-blocking foundation, which is also server agnostic. It's not, um, well, I should say servlet API agnostic, which means that we can also build on top of non-servlet containers. Right, um, so now um, we'll talk about a little bit more about the internal processing. Um, in a typical servlet application, we have a chain of filters and then you have the servlet, you know, and then the controller is processing from there. Um, the, in this processing model, um, blocking is kind of expected, right? I mean, if you think about the servlet contract, it's a, it's a method um, that returns void. And that means that if you have to do something which is blocking, we, we will have to wait for that to complete, right? Because it's a void method, it's not an asynchronous method. So that's kind of built into the server the API, into the very contracts. And that's not a bad thing, that's basically um, how the imperative works. You're doing one thing when the result of that is ready, doesn't matter how long it takes, you do the next thing, and that's a very simple way to write logic, right? Much simpler than dealing with asynchronous or concurrent code. And for this reason, Tomcat and Jetty and other servlet containers, they themselves use a very small constrained thread pool, just like React and Netty, like I showed you. But they have to provide a large thread pool on top for the processing of the requests because that may block. That's the model that this is built on. So you can do thread.sleep, you can do you know, call a remote, uh, services and that may block. This is perfectly okay and this is perfectly expected in a servlet application. 
Um, of course, if you do very, very long blocking, then you know, that begins to have consequences and a cost associated. This is one of the biggest things to understand you know, when you think about Webflux. You cannot block for the same reasons that when you're writing a Node.js application, if any of you have, but you can certainly understand the problem, you don't want to block. <laughs> because if you do, you're blocking the entire server. Now, you know, in Java, we're not limited to a single thread. But if we talk about using the same concurrency model, um, it's still a very small number of threads. Right? Typically, it's going to uh, match the number of cores on the server because we, we want to be concurrent as much as possible. But then going beyond that number doesn't make any sense because in this event loop programming uh, concurrency model, uh, we want to keep all the CPUs, all the cores busy. Um, and we're never, uh, we're never blocking, right? So we only need as much concurrency as the number of cores. We don't need any extra threads. So this is why uh, when, you, you know, when you're running on the event loop, we're actually going to call you in one of the very few threads that the server is running on. You don't want to block them because that's going to um, very quickly exhaust uh, the thread pool. So in order to support that sort of thing, we need every layer on top to be non-blocking. And this is where we have web filter, web, web handler in uh, Webflux. Just like in the servlet API, you have servlet and filter. So these concepts are very similar. We didn't find a big reason to change that you know, model. Uh, but the big change is that this is now returning a mono void. And mono void, uh, that's basically the promise uh, type in Reactor. Uh, you can think of it as a completable future, but it's you know, reactive and it's, uh, it's got more operators and it's, um, um, it does more things. Um, and void, well, that basically means that we're looking for the completion result. It's going to be, it's not a result value. It's just we want to know when does it complete and did it complete successfully. So you can get an error or you can get a completion signal on that mono. Then we have uh, ways to consume the request data, the request body, uh, through uh, instead of using input stream, as we do in the servlet API, where you do input stream dot read, and then you block until the data comes back, and you keep reading like that. Here we're getting a flux of data buffers, and that flux means that it's a promise, again, for the data to be given to us as it becomes available. We may not get it all in rapid succession. We may get it little by little with some time in between, but that's the whole you know, asynchronous non-blocking model. And also, using Flux in Reactor, it basically means that we are reactive streams enabled. So there's back pressure, which is translated against the non-blocking I.O. of the server. So what that means is that for anybody consuming from that Flux, you have control over how fast the data is being read. Right? You can say, don't slow down with reading, because what I'm doing with the data uh, is taking longer. So there's these kinds of mechanisms to control uh, the flow. Uh, the, the rate of the flow. Same thing on the response. Uh, again, this is not writing in current time. This is the promise to write. We're giving a, a flux to write with. And then uh, for that, we've built codecs. And these are like the HTTP message converters. And uh, the idea here is that we are serializing and deserializing the incoming data. Again, taking the chunks of data at a time. If we're talking about reading JSON, then little by little, when we get enough data for one JSON object, we're going to deserialize it. When we get more data, if it's not enough, we buffer it. And so we basically work in that mode in order to produce, start with a flux of, of, of bytes, and then finish with a flux of deserialized objects. All of that is kind of built into uh, the WebFlux foundation. Now, one thing which is actually very, um, um, unusual to, to get used to initially. If you think about using completable future and then by extension also Reactor or RxJava, uh, there are actually two distinct phases. Um, and this, the same point can be made about the Java 8 stream API too. The first phase is where you declare what is going to happen. Just like I showed you in the controller with the web client, when I say When we say web client here, dot uh, get, we're actually declaring what is going to happen. 
so there's a kind of a declarative phase where we say this is what's going to happen, but it's not happening yet. This is the big difference between imperative and asynchronous non-blocking, right? If you think about it, you can't, you, you're talking about what's going to happen in the future because it hasn't happened yet. That's kind of the nature of asynchronous um, logic. So during that declaration phase, uh, Reactor is helping to construct a processing chain, and you can see that at the bottom, uh, because when we actually start processing, when there is a subscriber at the end of that whole chain, once it's constructed, um, just like with the um, Java 8 Stream API, you know, nothing happens when you're writing those operators. It's at the end uh, that it actually triggers the whole thing into motion. So at that point, you know, when we start uh, triggering, it looks more like a, an, underneath at runtime, it looks more like a messaging, you know, event-driven processing, where you have uh, different phases, different stages of the logic being combined together, and then data is flowing back and forth. Um, this is the back pressure mechanism in action. You have a, um, from the consuming side, you have requests uh, to say, give me this much more data and then the data comes through. And if no more requests come, the data is not supposed to come through. So that's the concept of back pressure. Um, but again, all of that happens behind the scenes. You know, that's um, at the programming level, model level, you're still writing code uh, that looks um, uh, basically focused around the logic of the application, not the actual passing of data. So what happens in a WebFlux response uh, is something that looks like this. Um, you have WebFlux doing processing, you know, decoding and coding of data, you know, routing to different controllers, uh, deciding what to do with the return values. Um, the controller may be using a web client, so you, you have this entire chain constructed, processing chain, and then uh, all the way on the left-hand side, you, you see the, the adapter layer to the server. So that's where, depending on which server you're running to, Netty or Tomcat or Jetty, we're going to translate that non-blocking API into reactive streams back pressure and into uh, signals to request more data for the writing. And then the data flows through. Um, and the same thing happens for the request body. And those two, two things can be connected as well, but I can't show that in one slide very easily. Um, here you can see that uh, we're reading and then we have a data repository all the way on the right. So that's a reactive data repository. Um, and again, we have the ability to uh, indicate back pressure um, all the way from the data repository to the HTTP socket. So we can say stop or slow down uh, with the reading because um, you know, the back pressure isn't allowing it. Now with Spring MVC, we have uh, the ability to support this on the response side only, not on the request side. That's not easy to do. Um, um, so what happens here is that uh, we do support streaming with back pressure, but when we get to the actual server API, at that point we have no choice but to block because we're using the blocking API. And we're gonna do that in a dedicated thread. Uh, so we're gonna switch threads. Uh, we do that kind of automatically under the surface. So let's take a look at that in action. So this is the car location controller once again. Um, and I'm going to this time query that uh, directly. So let's just do a simple uh, listing of cars. Okay, so by default, um, if, you, if you see here, uh, the signature of this method returns a flux of cars. Now, this is an interesting challenge, actually, if you think about it, because a flux can represent a finite collection of items, JSON array, um, or this is more commonly the case, or it could be an infinite stream. So how do we actually know which one is which? Well, uh, by default, if you return a flux, uh, we take that to mean application JSON. Uh, so in the absence of any more specific information, uh, this is the best um, kind of conclusion to make. Uh, so uh, under the covers, what we do is uh, we call the collect to list operator, which collects all the data items. And when all that data is accumulated, then we write it back to the response in one. Uh, 
So basically, uh, here we assume that we're going to get all the data pretty quickly, and then we're going to write it out. Um, well, it doesn't have to be quick, but uh, basically it means that you will not see the results until we've seen all the data. That's when we're going to write it out. We're not streaming, basically. But at the same time, I can uh, do this in streaming mode. Uh, if I say accept application stream JSON. OK, so now we're getting it as a stream. And uh, a, a JSON stream is basically you know, just like a, a regular JSON, but one JSON object at a time, at a, at a per, per line. And you can see here that I've defined a second uh, method uh, which enforces the application stream JSON response type. Uh, what's different this time is that uh, we don't actually wait uh, for all the data, because that data, as you can see, the response is still um, waiting for more data to arrive. Um, and by the way, uh, what this is, is underneath it's using a tailable collection in Mongo, um, you know, which basically means we're going to wait uh, to see if more data shows up. So we're waiting here to, for more data to be streamed down. Uh, so that just comes to show that uh, this is an infinite stream and that it can be a long period of time between uh, the next item, the previous and the next item. Um, now I want to show from the output in the location service app. So here we're running with Webflux. And you can see the reactive streams protocol in action. Um, so initially, we were on the reactor Netty thread. And then uh, we made a call to the reactive repository, the data repository, Mongo. And that starts to give us data uh, on the flux. And that flux is connected to Netty so that when we have new items coming from the repository, we're going to write, serialize that, and then write it out uh, to the response, to the HTTP response. So what happens here is you can see that um, the re reactor Netty, in this case, is requesting unbounded, which means give me all the data you've got. That was the first call when we wrote application JSON as a JSON array. But if I scroll down to the next request over here, this one is the streaming uh, case. All right, let's do it again. Uh, this is from the beginning, actually. OK. Uh, you can see here that it requested one item, and then uh, it got one car, and then it requested 31 more, and then we got 31 more, and then it requested 24 more. And it keeps going like that, right? It's, it's controlled. The, control, the flow of the data is controlled through the reactive streams uh, protocol, and this is happening under the covers. You know, it's not something you have to deal with explicitly. You're just connecting the different pieces, um, and they work like that. So let's uh, switch to Spring MVC for a moment. Uh, yeah. Uh, do the reactive data reports support paging? Uh, yes, they do. Yeah, um, but. Um, you have the ability to control also on a flux like that, uh, how many items at a time. OK, so let's switch to Spring MVC. Oh, I should just, oh, actually, this is the wrong one. Car location. Okay, so start this. Okay, so now we're running with Tomcat. And we're going to make the same streaming request. And you can see that also works. So we have the ability to use uh, 
you know, reactive repositories, web client from Spring MVC as well. But you will see the interaction model is a little different, that it's actually doing one item at a time. Um, because in Spring MVC, it's actually doing a blocking write. So the way it adapts that to back pressure is to say, okay, let me write one. When that's complete, I'm gonna ask for another one. And then when that's complete, I'm gonna ask for another one and so on. But, you know, it's supported and it does apply back pressure um, against the um, upstream client. Okay, so back to Webflux, uh, because I'm gonna show one more thing here. Okay, so we're back on Webflux. Uh, now, in the controller, I have one more thing, which can only be done on Webflux. And that is the ability to stream in both directions. So you can see here, I have an additional method, which is actually a, um, um, a post, and that's accepting a stream of cars. And again, that's not something we can support in Spring MVC for the request body to take a flux. So literally, we're taking one item at a time as they come. And um, we're going to use a client application here. Uh, you can see that this is uh, using flux interval. Uh, every two seconds is going to generate a new uh, random car location again. Uh, this is just for the demo here. Uh, but you see how nice it is that I can take a flux of cars with uh, items coming every two seconds, um, and then I'm gonna give that to the web client, and that's going to start uploading this data every two seconds, new car, keep streaming, and I don't have to worry about managing the threads, and I don't have to worry about uh, managing the streaming part of it. So this is going to go into the uh, car location controller, and then we're gonna take that flux and then uh, give that to the reactive repository to insert. Um, so we're connecting the reactive functionality on both sides uh, with uh, those flux, um, fluxes. Okay, so let's run this. Okay, so now we're uploading. And we can see location service app. Oops, I never did restart. Okay, so here we go. Um, it, keeps, it keeps getting the new data. So basically I have one client uploading data as a stream, and then the Webflux controller takes that stream, inserts it into the Mongo collection, and then I have another client that's doing, pulling the stream of data, so as those locations are appearing in the Mongo, tailable Mongo collection, we're seeing them from another client as a stream. So, I mean, it just shows how easy it becomes um, that Webflux in this non-blocking paradigm is very naturally uh, fitted, very naturally suited for, for these kinds of streaming uh, scenarios. Now, about making choices. Uh, Spring MVC or Webflux? So this is kind of the big question, right? So which one should I use now that I have choice? Well, for many of you, it may be, you know, that's not the problem I'm trying to solve, and that's perfectly okay. Uh, but the, the point that I want to make here is actually, for a long time, you know, kind of wasn't, there was something bothering me about that question, and I realized um, that it's, it's actually sets up a false split. Um, because we're trying to create a lot of continuity and a lot of uh, consistency between Spring MVC and Webflux. So really, the first point to make is that we should be talking about Spring MVC and Spring Webflux. Both are available side by side in Spring Framework 5. We're not retiring one. We're not saying one is the new, one is the old. Uh, we're actually maintaining and, and moving both of them forward. We're not planning to retire Spring MVC in any way. Uh, form or shape. We actually anticipate a majority of applications will continue to run on the servlet stack, um, and we're looking for consistency and continuity between the two. So you can think of it as an expanded range of options. You have more tools in your tool chest. You have more options available to deal with the problem at hand. So you can think of it as um, kind of one gives you a simple imperative programming model um, built on a servlet API foundation. It allows you to, um, to, to block. It's okay to block, it's built for that. And you can use, if you have blocking dependencies in your application, 
uh, you can, um, yeah, I mean, it's a good fit uh, to use it there because that's fully expected. And then you have Webflux on the other side, and that gives you the benefits of an event loop concurrency model that can scale better uh, with less resources. It also gives you the ability to use uh, non servlet containers if that's important to you. Uh, but at the same, or the functional programming model, but at the same time you can see that they have a cross section in the middle where we're trying to provide some kind of continuity. Uh, so really the way to think about this is just a range of options on the dial, right? Uh, a, a whole variety of, of different um, uh, scenarios that we support. Um, and as you cycle through different situations, different kinds of applications, especially in the microservice scenario, uh, you can make different choices for different applications. And we try to stay with you and to support you and to minimize uh, the amount of change that's required. Um, so, I mean, to start with the obvious, uh, but if it's not broken, don't fix it. Because if you break it, then you own it. <laughs> um, so, um, I mean, joke aside, this is, this is an important point to make, right? There's a lot of existing applications, and many of them... Um, you know, if, you, if you're not suffering a problem, if you weren't already Googling what event loop means and concurrency and how do I scale with less hardware resources, if you don't have that problem, there's no need to change anything. So again, we anticipate that a lot of applications will continue to run uh, in this mode. And um, you know, there's no need to change. At the same time, you know, if you use the imperative model, it's simple, but it's simple until it's not. <laughs> When you start dealing with, and this is again, back to the uh, beginning of the talk, uh, the more asynchronicity you deal with, and I'm sure you know that from actual experience, it's not easy, right? Because you're dealing with concurrency, you're trying to use threads, you're trying to make remote calls, you're trying to um, make those dependent asynchronous calls work together. That's when it begins to become complicated anyway. You are now dealing directly with that yourself, and um, it's, um, you, you don't have first class tools to do that, right? Threat pool is not, I mean, it's easy, but ultimately um, it has a lot of uh, consequences. So at that point, it might be um, quite okay. It might be quite sufficient uh, to go to Spring MVC and to start using reactive clients. For example, using uh, the web client to make remote calls. That's a very common scenario. And I think a lot of applications are going to get exposed to reactive in this way. Um, so in this mode, you're largely still using an imperative programming model. Your controllers are still doing what they used to do, but now they can use the web clients to make um, uh, asynchronous non-blocking calls and then return that from the controller. So it's kind of an easy entry point into doing things more reactively. When you might consider using Webflux? <clears throat> um, so some scenarios to consider are... Um, you know, things like gateways or edge services, things that need to be um, very, very efficient or they can benefit really from uh, having a very low footprint. When, when those things become important, uh, that's, that's a good time to consider Webflux. High traffic, you know, again, it's going to take a lot more resources to do that in the blocking uh, way. Um, as I demonstrated with Webflux and non-blocking concurrency, um, it's exceptionally good at dealing with streaming. It's naturally suited for dealing with streaming because it's already processing things, bits of data at a time. Um, it can wait until the data comes without blocking any threads. Uh, so it's very good for dealing with latency. You know, in all of these scenarios that I showed you, all of these asynchronous things, there's never any blocking of threads. Um, so that, that is um, very good for uh, memory footprint, uh, for resource utilization, and it's also good for resilience. Uh, because on any given day, you know, when things spike in terms of spike of latency or spike of um, other performance characteristics, that can impact your server, whereas um, in unpredictable ways. And that's where resiliency comes in as a factor, that a non-blocking concurrency model is more resilient because it doesn't fall over uh, in the same way. It actually grows much more predictably, scales. Um, so basically, the big theme is high concurrency with less hardware resources. Um, another reason for using Webflux is the functional programming model that's only available in Webflux. If that's, you know, for some people, that's the angle through which Webflux becomes attractive. Um, the functional programming model is lightweight and transparent. And uh, to qualify what I mean by that, if you look at the source, it's literally 10, 10, 12 classes, 
I mean, that is very, very low commitment, <laughs> if you think of it, uh, getting into a relationship with a framework. <laughs> right? There's a lot less magic, and you get much more control. Uh, so it's a bit of a trade-off. Uh, you don't get all the features, but if you're talking about a microservice, which is um, you know, very focused, doing something very specific, not a large you know, uh, application doing a whole bunch of things, then this might be a very, very good fit, you know, something to try out. It's also a good fit for non-blocking concurrency because it emphasizes immutability um, and less side effects. Now, when we talk about uh, performance and better scale, um, I will say that you have to verify this for your scenario. Um, there are, you know, you will see some uh, performance tests, um, for example, in the talk after this one. Um, you will see some examples of that or some data, and there are other talks that will point that out as well. Uh, but the key thing to understand about uh, performance tests, uh, first of all, is that um, we're almost not comparing apples to apples, right? They're different concurrency models. They're never going to exhibit the same characteristics, and there's a very natural advantage on the side of Webflux when it comes to scale with less resources. That's because it's not using extra threads, and it's not doing any blocking. But in order to exhibit those differences, you really have to have some latency in the mix. I mean, don't take an existing application uh, doing you know, something regular and then uh, just load it and try it with Spring MVC or Webflux and seek uh, to uh, some, some great benefits. The way, when the differences become dramatic is when you have some latency in the mix. If you have, you have to simulate a slow client, a slow server, when you start throwing these things in, differences become big. And, uh, that's very um, much expected because of the different ways that they work. Things to look out for. Um, don't jump all in. Um, so by this time, and I've been doing this for two or three years now, you know, deeply involved um, in the reactive uh, development, but it was a big learning curve. And I'm not the only one saying it. There are lots of other people, very smart, who <laughs> have gone through a big learning curve. It's a huge adjustment to go from imperative to um, kind of asynchronous, dealing with asynchronous and non-blocking. Um, and depending on the team size or the background, this, this may be a huge factor. This is why, again, we think that having choice uh, is important. So start small, uh, adjust your expectations, and, and give it a lot of time you know, for learning and um, um, getting things right uh, little by little. Um, using Spring MVC with the web client is a great way to start getting used to um, the reactive paradigm if um, and when that's important. If you have third-party dependencies that block, uh, obviously that's another huge uh, giveaway that it's probably not the best fit for, um, for Webflux. Um, so typically, when you start thinking about the problem, you will tend to navigate towards one or the other. Uh, all I can say is until you learn more, until you get better with this, um, try to find an area where you can experiment. Uh, try to find uh, some corner of what you're developing that, um, or some application that um, doesn't have blocking dependencies, and that's going to naturally kind of constrain or make you focus on specific areas where you can get the benefits. Okay, um, that's all I wanted to, um, that's all I have uh, for uh, material, but uh, we have about five minutes, so I can take some questions. Yep. Okay, question about JDBC. Yep, so, uh, so at the moment, uh, JDBC is uh, only the blocking JDBC. We don't have any um, alternative. There are some um, individual you know, drivers for specific databases, but nothing really um, um, official. So, so basically, JDBC is still in the realm of you know, Spring MVC and uh, blocking, uh, but there is an effort. Um, actually, um, it's, it's actually now in the public. There's a mailing list for an asynchronous database driver uh, which is coming from Oracle. Uh, so that's something which is targeting Java, Java 10, whatever that means. <laughs> um, but it's, it's something that's coming. Um, from what I understand, they actually have an implementation against Oracle internally that they're testing with, uh, but they're building an API. Uh, I think it's gonna be called a ADBA. That's the official name they're 
or the name they're going with for now, because it's not actually JDBC, right? It's not sharing anything with JDBC. It's a new, this is the story, right, with Webflux and MVC uh, that we had to build a new stack. Uh, so it's called ADBA. So it's coming. Um, any others? Yeah? Um, so in the example, uh, we made one asynchronous call. Um, so the web client, we made one call to, <clears throat> we made one call to the cars client, but then within that we have a nested call to uh, the request car. So for each car we make a post. So th these are uh, in interdependent, there's, there's six different operations here that are combined together. And, and, and you can see here that through the composition API, and this is the power, right, of the reactive library, is that we can uh, take multiple different operations and we can combine them together to produce a single result in a single output stream. Yeah? Uh, say it a little louder. Exception handling, yes. Exceptions, errors happen. <laughs> Um, so there's a couple of things here. First of all, um, it's slightly tricky here because if you think about this method, uh, it may throw an exception uh, while it's being invoked or maybe later during the processing uh, and that happens in a completely different thread. Um, we actually support the exception handler annotation in both of these scenarios. So no matter how uh, the exception occurred, it will be routed through the exception handler. Um, you also have the ability to handle the exception through the operators of flux here. So you can say on error, resume, and then you can give it an alternative value. Uh, so there are multiple ways to, to actually deal with it. Um, and we do other extra things, for example, to uh, make sure that until at least one item comes successfully from the flux, uh, we don't do anything to the response yet because if an error happens, that gives us a chance to change the status. Otherwise, the response will get committed and then you can't change it anymore. Uh, so all of that is uh, very much supported. You can use controller advice, all of that uh, that you know from Spring MVC. So controller, question about controller advice and the functional endpoints. Uh, so the functional endpoints are completely alternative offering to the annotated controllers. Uh, they don't share any of those mechanisms. Um, they do run on the same foundation. Uh, so um, for example, in Spring Boot 2, um, um, the same at enable Webflux annotation uh, gives you the ability to write both. In, in one application, you can have both functional endpoints and controllers. In fact, um, if we look at the last one here at the bottom, the, this, this is a boot application and I'm declaring a bean with routes, exposing a bean with routes. And I, I could have also declared annotated controllers as well. Uh -huh. So yeah, so with the functional endpoints, uh, you're directly dealing with. So the big difference between annotated um, controllers and functional endpoints is the, with annotations you, you you put the annotations and then the framework calls you at the right time with the right inputs and then if there's an exception, it helps you to route it to the right place. With the functional framework, you're in control from start to end. So you're never uh, giving control to the framework and saying now you, you do the routing, you're actually in charge of the routing. You can see here, you're saying route um, and then you're directly in control at all points. So in this paradigm, actually, you're also directly dealing with exceptions. Mm -hmm. Uh, did you say Jackson? Jax, no, JaxRS services. JaxRS services. Um, so JaxRS, uh, so that would be more of a Spring Boot question. Uh, Spring Boot supports JaxRS, um, but uh, uh, Webflux with JaxRS, um, no, no. Um, JaxRS uh, in version two, they added some support for non-blocking, but it's nowhere near this level. It's uh, quite, quite low level and I think, I think it's completable future based so it's only for a single value. It's, um, yeah, it's um, not at this level, yeah. 
Thread locals. Um, so there is uh, thread locals are actually obviously not a not a fit for um, this asynchronous non-blocking world because things happen in different threads and they're actually shared threads that are we keep cycle through. Um, now there is a feature in Reactor uh, for a context, and that's a more functional way of doing things, where as you go down the pipeline of operators, you know that's the processing chain. Uh, there is a context that gets passed uh, from phase to phase, and um, as long as you're using Reactor at all levels, there is a way to pass contextual information through the layers. And actually, Spring Security uh, supports the at secure annotation on on controllers in this way. Uh, because if you think about it, they, they have to use this sort of mechanism to get to know who is actually um, currently processing. So I think we have to uh, wrap up, but maybe one more question if there's any. Okay, here. Spring Data REST still supported with WebFlux? Spring Data REST, I don't believe that supports uh, WebFlux um, at the moment, but I'm sure it's going to come. Thank you.